Thank you very much for joining us today. This is session one of the Remote Sensing for Freshwater Habitat webinar series. My name is Juan Torres Perez, and I will be your speaker during this session. I am accompanied by my colleague, Amber McCollum, who will be in charge of sessions two and three in the upcoming weeks. This webinar series will take place from September 17 to October 1st. This webinar consists of three one-hour sessions, which will be given on September 17, 24th, and October 1st. The same content will be presented on two different times each day, at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Time. You will only need to sign up for one of the sessions on each day. Also, you can access all the course materials on the web page shown on the screen. This includes the PowerPoint presentations, and a homework assignment that will be available towards the end of this webinar series. There will be time for questions and answers at the end of, this, of each session, but feel free to add your questions to the live chat at any time during this presentation. You may also submit questions to the emails shown on the screen. As mentioned, there will be one homework assignment and it should be submitted through Google Forms. This assignment will be available during the third week of this webinar series. You can receive a certificate of completion once you participate in all three sessions and complete the homework. The deadline for, su for submitting the homework is two weeks after the end of the webinar series. This is October 15. Please remember that due to the typically high number of participants that we have in these webinars, it usually takes about two months after the completion of the course to receive the certificates. Here are the prerequisites of the course. Basically, to take the fundamentals of remote sensing webinars or to have an equivalent knowledge of remote sensing. Again, all course materials can be found on the web page shown on the screen. The Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, or RSET, is under the umbrella of the Capacity Building Program of NASA, which at the same time is under the Applied Sciences Program. The purpose of the NASA RSET program is to help building the skills to acquire and use available NASA satellite and model data for decision support. We provide in-person and online trainings for which are, which are intended for policymakers, academia, NGOs, and other applied science professionals who want to incorporate NASA remote sensing techniques and tools into their daily activities. We provide introductory, intermediate, and advanced trainings on a variety of topics within the areas of air and work, water quality, disasters, land, and water resources. Here's an outline of the course. Today, we will go over some basic knowledge on remote sensing for aquatic ecosystems, limitations of remotely sensed data, combining multiple data types, and some case studies that have used remote sensing for studying aquatic freshwater ecosystems. Next week, we will concentrate on landscape genetics for freshwater ecosystems, and we'll talk about the Riverscape Analysis Project. Then, on the final session, we will concentrate on the Freshwater Health Index tool developed by Conservation International. Here's a summary of today's session. First, we're going to talk about the importance of freshwater ecosystems, what is ecosystem vitality, and what are some ecosystem services, and why there's a need to study these ecosystems from a remotely sensed perspective. Then, we will talk about different NASA Earth observations used for aquatic remote sensing, their advantages and limitations. And towards the end of the session, I will introduce some examples of tools available for analyzing freshwater ecosystems and their ecology. So, why is it important to study inland waters? Fresh water is essential for, for life survival on Earth. Millions of animals, including us humans, rely on freshwater ecosystems from the, for their water and food needs. They also provide a number of habitat and ecosystem services. Freshwater ecosystems provide habitats and sustenance for thousands of species and can also serve as transportation corridors between different environments. On a global basis, they are extremely important components of the carbon and nutrient cycles. Similarly, freshwater ecosystems also aid in the mitigation 
of climate and flood control. And for humans, they provide for irrigation of crops, hydroelectric power, and recreational spaces, spaces which in turn help the economy of the surrounding, area, the surrounding areas. During extreme events, such as hurricanes, storms, or significant rain events, tons of sediment from the different regions of the watershed end up in the rivers. Increases in surface temperature and drought also affect the health of the river systems as water volume is diminished by evaporation. This not only increases the concentration of suspended particulate matter, but also dissolved matter. And it also has a detrimental effect on the populations of organisms living in the river, and in some cases can lead to high mortality rates of fishes and invertebrates. Changes in land use and land cover because of anthrop anthropogenic actions through the watershed cause increases in sedimentation and eutrophication, particularly affecting the underwater flora of freshwater systems. Increases in eutrophication can also lead to harmful algal bloom events, which deplete the oxygen in the water column, and depending on the organism, can be detrimental to the health of animals and humans. As in any other natural ecosystem, invasive or introduced species have a profound effect on the local and native species as the former typically become opportunistic and occupy the niche of the local ones. In the Great Lakes, for example, the Great Lakes Aquatic Non-Indigenous Species Information System, or GLANSIS, which is a joint USGS and NOAA effort, have identified 184 non-native species so far, including anything from microscopic cyanobacteria to algae, plants, invertebrates, and even fishes. The dumping of wastewater materials, either organic, inorganic, or toxic, is another human action that deteriorates not only the quality of the water, but also reduces the, the aesthetic beauty, if you will, of freshwater ecosystems. In my home country in Puerto Rico, for example, I have witnessed of many equations how people dump anything from electrodomestic equipment, such as old refrigerators, to even cars. In many countries, due to poor management practices and poorly implemented policies and regulations, people dump great amount of pesticides and fertilization products into the rivers, not only affecting the riverine ecosystems, but also the coastal and marine ecosystems on the lower parts of the watershed. Most of the world's water is actually in the ocean and not in freshwater ecosystems, in fact. Less than 1% of the fresh water is accessible for human use. It is estimated that 80% of the world's human population is threatened with insufficient water quantity or quality. Furthermore, it is estimated by, that by 2030, this is a little more than 10 years from now, our planet's needs for water would outpace its reliable supply by 40%, further increasing the need for water to satisfy the human demand. Two very important indicators for assessing the health of freshwater systems are ecosystem vitality and ecosystem services. Some indicators for ecosystem vitality include biodiversity, water quality and quantity, and drainage, drainage basin condition. Some ecosystem services include provisioning, regulation and support, and cultural, social, and economical services. Here are some indicators of ecosystem vitality and typical data sets that are used for assessing them. Water quantity can be expressed in terms of deviation from the natural flow and groundwater storage, whereas water quality is usually analyzed with indices for particular constituents, such as chlorophyll A, coral dissolved organic matter, total suspended sediments, and others. Typical data sets used for water quantity include river gauges, different hydrological models, such as the Soil and Water Assessment Tool, or SWAT, and the Coupled Groundwater and Surface Water Flow Model, or GS Flow. And these can be combined with other global models, just as, such as WaterGap, and satellite data from sensors, such as GRACE, MODIS, Landsat, or others, which, for which there are already available products uh, for different water quality parameters.
Other indicators of ecosystem vitality are drainage basin condition and biodiversity. This can be assessed in terms of extent of channel modification, land cover naturalness, and changes in species populations. Some data sets that have been incorporated in tools, such as the Freshwater Health Index, which we will mention towards the end of this presentation, include local databases and aerial photography complemented with high and moderate resolution satellite data, land cover products, and different species data sets. For ecosystem services, provisioning can be measured in terms of water supply reliability and biomass available for consumption using local data sets or models, such as the Water Evaluation and Planning Model, or WEAP, and local data complemented with more global hydrologic and evapotranspiration modeling efforts. The European Space Station actually will be launching soon the Earth Explorer biomass satellite, which will provide global maps of carbon storing forests and changes with time. Sub-indicators for regulation include sediment, water quality, flood, and disease regulations, which are assessed by complementing ecosystem models, such as INVEST, data from local stations and aerial photography, with satellite data from instruments such as synthetic aperture radar or even visible data, and global flood mapping efforts. In fact, INVEST, for those of you who don't know, is a suite of free open source software models for mapping and evaluating the goods and services provided by natural ecosystems. It includes 18 different ecosystem service models designed for terrestrial, freshwater, marine, and coastal ecosystems. It can also be run in QGIS or ArcGIS and does not require knowledge of Python programming. Now, what are some considerations that we need to take into account when selecting Earth remotely sensed data for studying freshwater ecosystems? Here's a list of, of the satellite missions whose data are typically incorporated into water quality monitoring program, projects or programs. There's the Landsat series, uh, for instance, Landsat 7 and 8, but consider also that particularly for Landsat 7, there's a data gap in images due to a sensor failure, yet it still captures about 75% of each image. The Landsat 8 Operational Land Imager, or OLI, has a coastal band in the blue region, which is designed for coastal observations, particularly for assessing shallow water features, but can also be used for fresh water ecosystems. The main sensor of Terra and Aqua is the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectrohadiometer, or MODIS, as has been extensively used for land, marine, and atmospheric studies. SOMIS MPP Visible Infrared Imaging Radiometer Suite, or BIRST, follows on the legacy of MODIS in terms of spectral bands, spatial resolution, and uses. And the European Space Station Sentinel series provide Landsat-type data, but at a slightly higher spatial resolution. NASA has a suite of satellites that provide directly or indirect information about freshwater components. The Landsat series, for instance, has spatial resolutions on the order of 15 to 60 meters, depending on the, on the band of interest. MODIS goes from about 250 to one kilometer, but has a, a higher spatial, a higher temporal resolution, actually, uh, as well as SOMI MPP. And the Sentinel series, from the European Space Station have, has different imagers depending on the platform and have different temporal resolutions also depending on the platform. Well, now from those of you uh, online, and by the way, we have hundreds of people from just about everywhere in the world online uh, ac uh, accessing this webinar now, right now. Uh, we'd like to know first if you have used some of this data before, and second, what do you think of it? Has it been useful? or has it not? Or are there any other recommendations that you guys might have? Please take a moment during any time, any time during this webinar to type in your thoughts and questions. Now, 
Well, there are many there are many differences uh, between data from various remote sensing sources, and there are some common characteristics that include the scale and availability of remotely sensed data for large regions that are sometimes inaccessible. Many satellites have been in operation for a long time, and this assists in an ability to establish land-based landscape baselines and to track changes over time. There are consistent measurements globally that can easily be compared across regions, and there's a diversity of measurements from spectral reflectance that can be used to monitor vegetation health, water quality, and other parameters. Remotely sensed data can be used in conjunction with field-based observations, which often serve for cross-validation measures. And finally, data are mostly free and open access, and all data available from NASA are free. Now, the moderate resolution of Landsat, for example, provides for the classification of open water and vegetated areas, and this information can be used to delineate main and side channels of river flow, for, example, for instance. It can further be combined with digital elevation maps to visualize and assess the extent of drainage uh, channels and floodplains. This is particularly useful to analyze the extension of flood events, such as the August 1993 Great Mississippi flood. The false color images from Landsat 5 thematic mapper sensor on the right shows the limitations from top to bottom of the Illinois, the Mississippi, and the Missouri River. And here's uh, the city of St. Louis, Missouri, as a reference. This is I mean, an image before the flooding event of 1993. And here's another image showing the extent of the flooding event uh, of, of that year. And you see here, <clears throat> You see here on the, uh, the dark pink areas that show where the flood waters have drawn back and revealed the scout land. Here's another comparison for the same area and rivers, but showing the extent of the rivers during 2018, during the normal, normal times, and in 2019, several months ago, after a re more recent flooding event. Again, the pink areas show where the flood waters have drawn back and revere some of the some of the scored land. Now, one of the greatest limitations of using satellite imagery is the spatial resolution. This is the size of each, each, each pixel on the image. This could be particularly problematic when dealing with spatial analysis of relatively small areas. Here's a comparison of three different images from exactly the same area on the island of St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. On the top, we see the original true color images. And on the left, we see an aerial imagery with a 30, meter, 30 centimeter uh, pixel size resolution, where we can see clearly defined the details of the Clinton Phipps racetrack in St. Thomas and how it becomes less and less obvious at a 10 meter resolution and a 30 meter resolution for Sentinel and Landsat respectively. Therefore, it is extremely important to consider the sensor spatial resolution with selected remotely sensed data to analyze small areas or narrow systems. Now, spatial resolution, as I mentioned in the previous slide, can be a limitation of using remotely sensed data, particularly if the interest is on delineating or assessing relatively small or narrow areas, narrow freshwater systems. Those pixels close to the river or creek edges can be contaminated with land derived information and can produce false results. This is where additional imagery from high resolution sensors can be particularly useful in complementing the freely available Landsat or similar data. It can be either airborne data or commercially available satellite data. Nonetheless, keep in mind that sometimes there's an extensive processing needed with some, uh, with some of this data before it's even appropriate for analysis. The images on the right show both a Landsat image from the Uruguay River Basin and a high resolution image provided by Planet's disaster program of the same river 
showing more details, particularly on those populated areas near the river, uh, near the river during a flood event in May of 2017. Now, we would like to know if any of you guys have found similar problems, particularly when dealing with the special resolution of some of the satellite imagery. So feel free to post them on the chat during, uh, during, uh, during this uh, presentation. These are some of the considerations at the time of choosing satellite data. You have to think about the temporal resolution of the data acquisition, whether it's a daily basis or on a monthly basis. Uh, the special resolution uh, obviously depends on the satellite or the sensor. The spectral resolution, whether it's a multispectral sensor or a hyperspectral sensor, and particularly where in the electromagnetic spectrum on the satellite bands, if it's visible, infrared, or others. The longevity of the satellite mission, for instance, Landsat has the longest, the longest record on satellite data since the 1970s. What are the geographical and atmospheric conditions at the study site? Typical zones, uh, I mean, tropical zones typically have more cloud cover year round, so it's even more difficult to get a longer time series. Uh, other considerations are is if the data is freely available, is there or if there's a cost associated with data acquisition. And also you can also need to consider whether there are any future uh, missions being planned. I'm just gonna mention two of them here, which is uh, first gonna go, uh, the plankton aerosol cloud and ocean ecosystem or PACE. PACE is scheduled for launch around 2022, and it will have a spatial resolution of about one kilometer. The other one, is the SBG or social biology and geology, which is scheduled for 2025 to 27. Uh, it's still in the in the first phases of, of, of planning the mission. And it is proposed with a spatial resolution of 30 to 60 meters. This, both of these sensors are, are planning to be hyperspectral sensors. So There's gonna going be multiple bands to work with. These are widely used water quality indicators for both fresh water and, fresh, and marine ecosystems. Color this of organic matter. And for instance, in the case of freshwater ecosystems, an equivalent for sea surface temperature will be water surface temperature. The fluorescence line height, which is a relative measure of the amount of radiance leaving the water column, presumably as a result of chlorophyll A fluorescence. And euphoric depth, which is the depth well, the photosynthetically active radiation is 1% of that at the surface. Now, whenever a water quality study is performed using remotely sensed imagery, it is vital to collect in situ data to validate the image processing analysis. Some of the most important among the many parameters typically sampled for are chlorophyll A and total suspended sediments, among others. Different types of radiometers are commercially available, and the sensitivity to specific wavelengths vary from instrument to instrument. But also, usually water samples are collected and processed in the lab for pigment analysis and concentration of suspended particles. Why? Each of these constituents absorb light at particular wavelengths. Hence, knowing how much of each of them is present in the water column is important in order to interpret the spectral signal received by the sensor in orbit on air or airborne. The signal will be affected by the inherent and apparent optical properties of the water media. We'll talk about inherent optical properties in the next slide. Apparent opt optical properties depend on the inherent optical properties on the geometry of the light regime. Some of these properties have already been discussed in previous RCET webinars, like the water quality monitoring webinar offered last year. These include properties like upwelling radiance, water living radiance, and remote sensing reflectance. Now, looking at the graph on the screen, we can see the different regions of the spectrum, particularly in the visible and the near infrared. And we can, and when we can see, for example, where chlorophyll A reflects more on the green, Part of the spectrum. This is why we see the plants green and absorb in the blue and in the red. Whereas sediment, on the other hand, absorbs more in the blue and in the, and in the near infrared and reflects more on the yellow and the red region of the spectrum.
Now, light absorption in the water column depends on different factors. Some of the constituents of water column that affect light absorption include phytoplankton absorption, sediments, coral dissolved organic matter, and the water itself. Now, light attenu attenuation, which is a combination of absorption and scattering, uh, also depends on the scattering particularly of particles in, in the, either the forward or backward directions. Here's an image of the Mississippi River plume that shows uh, where some of these different constituents can be found. And actually, if you take a look at the, at the river plume here, it looks kind of like chocolate to me, doesn't it? Now, obviously, depending on the particular area of study, researchers have used different sensors. And here's a table that summarizes some of these. Typically, there are two types, uh, active or passive sensors. Passive sensors can, can be either from simple digital cameras to multispectral or hyperspectral uh, uh, sensors or imagers. And active sensors are usually things like synthetic aperture radar or LIDAR. And uh, active sensors have been used, for instance, uh, for determining depth, for determining uh, water surface extent, and others. Whereas passive sensors are usually used for water column characteristics, bathymetry sometimes, water quality, and even to detect submerged aquatic vegetation, among others. By the way, we'd like to know if any of you in the audience have worked with any of these uh, sensor type uh, data, say, uh, passive or active data, and particularly for analyzing any of these parameters that we have on the screen on the table here. But we'd like to know what you do with that data. So feel free to uh, post your thoughts. Let us know. We'd like to know about it. Now, since the 1980s, researchers have used Landsat to retrieve information from lakes, particularly information related to chlorophyll A, depth, total suspended matter, water transparency in the, in the form of vertical attenuation coefficients, uh, and cyanobacterial blooms, and CDOM. The graphs on the right show the similarities of Landsat thematic mapper, enhanced thematic mapper, and OLI sensors in retrieving total suspended matter in lakes. The figure on the left shows the increase in surface reflectance signal when comparing two different lakes, one with clear waters and another one with a high concentration of total suspended matter. I highly recommend for those of you who are more interested in these particular themes to, to look for the special issue of remote sensing of the environment uh, uh, in 20, for 2015, dedicated particularly for remote sensing of inland waters. And here is the link for that particular issue. Other ocean color intended sensors have also been applied to lakes. In the early days, the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, or CCCS, was used for chlorophyll A and detecting upwelling zones. Uh, sea waves, the sea viewing wide field of view sensor, have been used for water clarity and detecting chlorophyll A and other parameters, as well as MODIS and MERIS uh, for detecting similar parameters as well in the water column. The image on the left shows a series of MODIS derived surface water temperature measures for the Great Salt Lake in Utah. In this case, level two one kilometer data was obtained and the product was generated using MODIS bands 31 and 32, which are on the infrared region. Now, coral dissolved organic matter is the optically active part of dissolved organic matter in the water column. It is also known as yellow substance, chromophoric dissolved organic matter, humic color, and gel stuff. It occurs naturally but can increase due to runoff, sewage discharges, and also due to extreme weather events such as hurricanes. In the graph here, we see the, the, the gradually decreasing absorbance of CDOM with wavelengths and the band locations of Landsat. The black numbers, for instance, indicate the bands of the previous, previous Landsat missions, and the red numbers indicate the bands of the Landsat OLI. You can see here actually the coastal band of Landsat OLI. 
So, so dissolved organic matter and, and color of dissolved organic matter results from the decomposition of detritus and other organic materials. It reduces the availability of light in the water column, particularly in the blue region, which is a problem for photosynthetic organisms, since chlorophyll A, the main photosynthetic pigment, absorbs in the blue region of the, of the spectrum, as we saw earlier. The typical bands from sensors com uh, include combinations in around 440 uh, nanometers and beyond 600 nanometers and are used for quantifying uh, CDOM. Particularly, the new coastal band in Landsat 8 has proven to be very useful for CDOM detection. And here's an example from, uh, from Brazil, where we see the, uh, different CDOM concentrations depending on the season. Now, other parameter that can be used for studying water quality in freshwater systems is detecting the amount of submerged aquatic vegetation. For instance, Brooks et al. in 2015 used the Landsat time series to study cladophora, which is a green algae, in the Great Lakes. In fact, a similar project was conducted here at the NASA developed at, uh, at the Ames, Ames Research Center in California to detect and map the displacement of cladophora in Lake Michigan, in particular using Landsat 8 and MODIS data. This is an example of some of the data that was uh, collected, where you see in dark green the dense amounts of uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, cladophora in this case, and light green areas where there was less dense uh, aquatic vegetation, and even where there's sand, there was sand detected by the, uh, by the analysis. Here in the, in the top right, you see uh, this is a diagram that shows again the different constituents that affect the light availability in the water column and that also affect the information that we receive in the sensors. Submerged aquatic vegetation, phytoplankton uh, biomass, suspended sediments, and others. Now, in fact, one of the first attempts to retrieve, retrieve accessory pigments and phytoplankton functional types from airborne data was in lakes. Re more recently, a hyperspectral uh, airborne data has been used particularly for detecting uh, phacocyanin, which is uh, one of the main pigments of cyanobacteria. Here's, a, here's an image from Lake Erie that shows the, the plume of the of a cyanobacterial event. And the image on the right shows data collected during the Hispiri preparatory mission a couple of years ago. In this case, it shows data from Pinto Lake, which is a lake uh, located in, in Watsonville in Monterey Bay in California. And the data was collected with the AVRIS, uh, which is, stands for Airborne Visible Infrared Imaging Spectrometer, sensor, which is a hyperspectral sensor flown on board the NASA ER-2 aircraft at an altitude of 65,000 feet, which gave a nominal ground resolution of about 50 meters. This is a small inland lake, which is characterized by seasonal, nearly monospecific blooms through the year, and has been studied particularly by the University of California and Santa Cruz group for many, many years. Other parameter that can, that can be studied in shallow water river systems is the bathymetry or the depth of the, of the, of, of the water. In terms of shallow waters in particular and clear waters, the upwell in spectral reflect, uh, radiance depends mostly on the bottom radiance and the absorption of pure water itself. Actually, Lake Dider at all uh, about a decade ago, the, the rivet, what they called the optimal band ratio analysis or OBRA for uh, estimating, estimating bathymetry in clear shallow rivers. And this is a simple ratio that uses two different bands, around 586 and 614 nanometers. It was developed mostly for MERIS data, but can also be applied uh, on similar bands to other, with other uh, instruments as well. Now, when it comes to eutrophic systems, the water column constituents, being CDOM, uh, sediments, and chlorophyll A, may make the bottom contribution you know, just negligible. Here's, a, here's an image, a photo from the Manatee River system in Puerto Rico, on the north coast of Puerto Rico, 
And you can see that it's uh, the concentration of sediments is so high that there's no way that you can see the bottom. Now, a uh, uh, group from, from Pamela et al. in 2015, they develop a support vector regression as an alternate, alternate method for collecting data in turbid waters. And it uses, instead of uh, using only two bands, it uses the whole spectrum. Now let's see some examples for water quality studies that have been conducted in freshwater ecosystems. One of them is the Lake Erie uh, HAP tracker which is a forecasting model that uses MODIS data and incorporates weather uh, and other uh, water currents data. It also incorporates in-situ water quality data that is collected frequently on the lake. And it produces a near real time on a five day uh, forecasting uh, data for particularly for detecting cyanobacteria in Lake Erie. Another project dealing with water quality and uh, monitoring in freshwater ecosystems is the Riverscape Analysis Project, or RAP. This is an effort of the University of Montana and the Northwest Climate Science Center, and it was funded by NASA. And it's aimed at producing a decision support system, particularly for the conservation of salmon species. My colleague, Amber McCollum, will be doing a demo of some of the features of RAP next week. But in summary, RAP provides GIS and modeling tools to use remotely sensed data, model it, and produce habitat suitability and classification analysis for monitoring salmon. It includes a number of abundance and genetic metrics for planning and conserving salmon species, particularly in the North Pacific Rim. The project also includes a big citizen science component where anyone can contribute with in situ data. We will cover the Freshwater Health Index on the third session of this webinar series. In summary, it was developed by Conservation International and is a web-based uh, tool that measures uh, system health by linking freshwater ecosystems with the benefit that they provide to humans. It mainly, it mainly evaluates two different components, ecosystem vitality, ecosystem services, which we talked about them earlier during this, uh, during this session, and governance and stakeholders. Here's a list of the role the reference that were used in this session. Remember that you can contact me or my colleague Amber McCollum at the emails that, are, that, that you can see on the screen. And for more specific inquiries about the RCET program in general, you may also contact our program director, Dr. Ana Prados. And you can also find more information about the program and additional trainings on the RCET website shown on the screen. Now, thank you very much for your attention. Be sure to tune in next week for the, for the, for the next session, for session two of this webinar series, where Amber is going to give a great demonstration about the Riverscape Analysis Project. Now, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Feel free to post them. And we're going to try to answer some of them now, and the rest of them will be answered in the Q&A Google form that will be available on the website by the end of this week. Thanks. We've already answered uh, some of them. Uh, for instance, uh, how to control the impact on climate change and water quality. There's a, there's a number of factors that are uh, particularly important for uh, controlling uh, for climate, that influence climate change and also in, uh, has an influence on the on water quality uh, for instance uh, salt water intrusion particularly in coastal areas uh, also uh, even increases in temperature uh, as well have, a, have a, an impact on the on the water quality in the in, in fresh water uh, ecosystems. Let's see uh, which satellites uh, capture the chip uh, movement detection in in the in sea and the uh, and the effects on the uh, freshwater health index. Um, there is a number 
of uh, actually there's a number of websites that uh, you can go through if you're for uh, for detecting shift move, move, shift move movements. There's one called vesseltracker.com, uh, and uh, and you can you, you do a login there, and they use it. They use a number of satellites to tracking for tracking uh, 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 chips. Uh, also, even from from planet uh, planet labs, they have also uh, data available. Obviously, this is a, a, a private data, and there's a, there's probably a cost associated with it. And there's another website uh, that is called Genscape uh, as well. That it's uh, it, it uses it, it tracks about uh, so far about 170,000 different vessels with satellite data. It's called Genscape. What is the highest uh, spatial resolution data available from NASA? Uh, that depends on the type of data that you're using. Uh, Landsat is uh, is the highest so far. It's about 30 meters spatial resolution. Um, MODIS has a, a coarser data, but also there's data uh, from the European Space Station uh, from Sentinel that is, has a little bit higher uh, spatial resolution. What portion of the OM is the OM observable from remote sensing? So what portion of the OM? It actually uh, depends on the on what is the uh, the freshwater ecosystem that that uh, that you're working with, uh, and it, it will depend on the different uh, constituents of the water of the water column, and uh, and also on the on the amount of detritus that it's. Uh, that it's uh, being decomposed in the water uh, as well. So that's, that's some of the factors that, uh, that affect the, the proportion of, of CDOM uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, in, in, on its, and its relationship with, with, with uh, this of organic matter. Imagine to detect uh, fresh water. This is uh, an example of this. Is what uh, what I what I talk about in the uh, during the uh, presentation, particularly for Pinto Lake, and here in in in, in Watsonville in Monterey Bay in California, we used uh, data from the average sensor, which is a hyperspectral sensor, and the sensor was flown on the ER2, a really uh, high altitude, 65,000 feet. Uh, and, uh, and and it was um, it's particularly useful for detecting uh, algal blooms in in in, in lakes and freshwater ecosystems as well as in, in seawater. We already answered uh, question six there uh, with some of the samples and uh, there's a there's a reference that you can see and you can uh, that's uh, been cited there. Are uh, there any plans by NASA or ESA to capture higher resolution imagery in order to support studies of water quality? Um, the, the 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 sensor of unfortunately the uh, the the, answer, the quick answer is no. Uh, the 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 sensor that was uh, mentioned, uh, for instance, it's called SBG, Surface Biology and Geology. It's still on the under development on the first phases of development. I will still have a, a similar resolution uh, as uh, the one that Landsat uh, has, about 30 meter, 30 to 60 meter uh, pixel size. Okay, the groundwater <clears throat> uh, for estimating groundwater use for irrigation. Hi, hi Juan. Um, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, I was just typing in an answer here. So, um, in terms of groundwater estimation, there is the GRACE satellite, the Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, and mm -hmm. the follow-on to that. However, the spatial resolution is quite large, um, and we'll provide a reference to to those data for you. Um, so, with GRACE. Um, what's being measured is changes in um, gravity anomalies on Earth, and um, we have the ability to translate that into changes in total water storage and 
using a water budget, you can then break it down into surface water versus groundwater. Um, however, as I mentioned, uh, these are over very large areas. And so th those data might not be useful for something like irrigation monitoring. Um, there are other tools available uh, using Landsat data to monitor uh, vegetation health and um, also evapotranspiration. And so those have been used um, for farmers and um, for managing irrigation in California. Um, there's a tool called OpenET, um, and we'll provide the link to that as well. Um, so that's not really getting at the groundwater component, but that's um, more related to irrigation management. Um, and then finally, the last um, sensor I'll mention is SMAP, which is the Soil Moisture Active Passive, and that measures uh, soil moisture also um, at pretty large spatial resolutions, over a kilometer, um, to a depth of, I believe, uh, 10 centimeters, but I'll have to double check on that. Um, and so that could be used for uh, monitoring um, soil moisture, again, for very large regions. So. Um, there's not a really great answer to that question, but there are a few different options um, available. Okay, thanks. Um, can we mention bathymetry? Uh, this, this is what, what uh, the the paper that I mentioned from Lake Lighter uh, et al. Um, that uses the OBRA uh, uh, algorithm. But uh, keep in mind that this algorithm was particularly developed for really for for uh, water systems that are uh, have a really clear waters. Uh, so so you have to be uh, uh, careful with that because it only considers uh, two different bands uh, uh, for for doing the, uh, the bathymetry of, of rivers. Um, for for waters that have more constituents uh, 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 in the in the water column, there's a there's other uh algorithm that was developed by pan at all and the and the, this is mostly uh in order the difference is that it incorporates uh bands from all the all the uh, the the spectrum the visible spectrum and it helps to uh to differentiate between uh the bottom and other uh, constituents in the water column is there a vector map uh for all water systems uh globally for I would I would recommend uh, uh, a couple of different ones. There's a there's one that was a, the, there's a world map that was developed by Harvard uh, University, and this one uh, contains data from practically uh, all the world rivers uh, in the world, and you can download uh, data from there. Um, uh, actually, uh, another uh, resource is from the USGS. The USGS have the different maps that also include uh, the location of, of all of, of, uh, of rivers, uh, pretty much, uh, particularly from the from the US, but, uh, but also data from other sites as well. How come we obtain the data for an aquatic body uh, completely covered with aquatic plant like essence? Can we get the data from our <clears throat> on all the parameters of aquatic uh, ecosystems for these conditions? This would be a tough one because uh, what we what you would uh, get is uh, if it's covered uh, mostly with uh, with with plants, um, what you would get there is uh, uh, you can use uh, for instance. Uh, Probably some algorithms that have been developed, like uh, like um, uh, what's called L A L A L A I, uh, <clears throat> and uh, leaf area index, and then uh, and that would be that would pretty much give you only the, the information about the about the composition of the plants. So, so if it's covered, remember that when but if that if it's completely covered with with, with plants. Uh, what you get is the, the data that is reflected from the plants themselves, but not necessarily from the water column. Uh, so that would be, be particularly 
particularly uh, hard to do to to get data from the water column beneath the uh, the plants. Yeah, as uh, for question thirteen, uh, as, as Amber is uh, is, uh, is uh, writing down, we are uh, we're going to be discussing the freshwater health thing that's in particular during session three, and uh, so that one would be useful for answering that particular question. I'm reading here question 15. Uh, how effective would be the detection for the CDM tracking in smaller, older uh, tributaries? Um, remember that, uh, that in the case uh, of the of, of NASA data, particularly Lanza, uh, you're using data that has a spatial resolution of 30, 30 meters. Um, so if it's uh, if it's a really small uh, tributary, you will probably get a, a influence uh, on, the, on the on the the pixels from whatever is uh, covering the the surrounding areas of those tributaries. So that's uh, one thing that you have to uh, uh, take into consideration. That you might get data that it's not necessarily uh, related to the water of the of the tributary. So in that case, definitely be recommended to look for other alternate, uh, alternative uh, uh, <clears throat> sources of data or probably even higher resolution data uh, from other sources. So going back to question 14, um, the question is in regards to estimating land surface temperature from previous Landsat satellites. Um, yes, it can be done, and uh, I'll include a link to a research paper that um, has done mm -hmm. that. Um, it's a commonly uh, used product from Landsat 8, and I believe there are some uh, derived products available from the USGS for Landsat 8, but I believe for the previous Landsat sensors, you have to do the calculation yourself. Uh, freely available digital elevation model. Um, I know that the USGS has digital elevation models available, um, and I can provide a link to that as well. Ah, and someone there has um, mentioned SAR data, um, mm. and we do have a lot of SAR trainings generally um, under the disasters and water resources areas on the RSET website. So I would encourage you all to take a look at those. Um, and there, there will be another upcoming SAR training in October that um, will cover DEMs from SAR data. So um, take a look at that. Um, we've generally, um, for our land trainings, we've really focused on optical sensors, um, but SAR data is really um, becoming a widely used tool. Um, for remote sensing of um, especially elevation. Um, and then there's another question here about um, looking at rivers less than 10 meters in width. Um, again, uh, the most commonly used sensor, I think, is, is Landsat and then MODIS. And those are a little too coarse in terms of the spatial resolution to um, study a uh, river that small. So I would encourage you to maybe look into um, commercial sensors for that. So um, maybe um, using Worldview 2, uh, which I believe is about a meter, um, and we yeah. could provide a link to, to those data as well. Um, so in, in terms of um, studying those systems, NASA satellite data might not be your best option. Um, but then there are you know, pros and cons to using the commercial satellite information as um, oftentimes they are not freely and widely available. Mm -hmm. the, the other alternative would be if, it's, if they are uh, readily accessible, the, the headwaters, would be to even uh, explore the possibility of using drones uh, mm. to capture data 
at a centimeter scale uh, resolution. Yeah, that's something that we haven't really covered in our trainings, mm -hmm. but um, drones are being used in a lot of cases for smaller study areas mm -hmm. um, and for things like that. And, and I know that um, there are also drones out there that have things like temperature sensors as well um, to study river systems. So that's a good point one. Mm -hmm. For detecting plants washed out of by the Amazon River to the sea, um, uh, definitely recommend looking into uh, you know Landsat data that that could be could be useful at a perimeter uh, resolution. Particularly if we're, to, if, we're if you're thinking about uh, a high amount of, of plants being washed out uh, uh, by the Amazon River. Uh, for instance, I know that not necessarily being washed by rivers, but there's uh, with the with the situation of the sargassum uh, uh, seaweed in the Caribbean, Landsat and, and, and even MODIS has been used uh, to track uh, sargassum in the Caribbean. So uh, similarly, they, those can, can also be used for for uh, detecting uh, plants washed out by by large large rivers such as the, the Amazon. Um, and just uh, going on to question 20, um, the question asks what satellite can be used for soil moisture um, in Africa? And so I've mentioned the um, SMAP sensor there again. Again, SMAP is pretty coarse resolution and um, has a couple day repeat time. So um, if you're interested in uh, sort of a daily time series, you might not be able to get the soil moisture aspect of that. Um, you could monitor vegetation health um, via, via MODIS, which is um, daily. Um, and you could also, there are uh, additional uh, resources out there that use drought indices, which are um, generally precipitation anomalies to understand drought. Um, on a large scale. So looking at things like the um, standardized precipitation index or the Palmer drought severity index. Um, some of these indices incorporate uh, models and ground station data um, as well as uh, remotely sensed data. Um, one place that you might want to look um, for some of those type of data is a climate engine. Um, that's a really great resource for mapping drought, and it has some of those drought indices on there. It doesn't have SNAP data, but um, it's, a, it's a good starting point for that. And for the models uh, that were mentioned, we'll make sure that we include the, the, we'll include the, the links uh, for those models. What satellite data can I, can I use to map coral reefs? Well, it's not particularly related to freshwater ecosystems, but uh, but the, uh, the 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 thing about coral reefs is that they are they are uh, ecosystems that are um, highly di diverse, so it's hard to find data that has the so the high, very high spatial resolution. If you want to differentiate between the different components of, uh, of coral reefs, let's say between corals, algae, algae, and other factors, other benthic components, um, Landsat data has been used uh, on a, as a, on a coarser uh, resolution. Usually, also there's uh, uh, even MODIS or burst data has been used, but not necessarily to map coral reefs, but to to assess the water quality around coral reef areas and then relate that to the health of the ecosystems uh, also. And uh, and again, lately, uh, a lot of uh, drone data has been used for, for, for mapping coral reefs at really, really high uh, resolution, centimeter scale resolution. And uh, the, the next question there asks about how to um, incorporate information from satellites such as TRIM to quantify precipitation. And 
um, we have included a link there to another RSET webinar um, looking at global precipitation measurements, GPM. So RSET does have an entirely separate, well, not separate, but another application area for water specifically. Um, so that, that I would encourage you all to go to the RSET website and take a look at um, the trainings related specifically to water and precipitation um, and looking at things like drought as well as um, flood mapping, those kinds of things. Yeah, and that there's a there's another good comment there. Um, the there are products available. Um, iMerge is um, kind of the most commonly used product available that integrates both trim and GPM data to obtain a long time series uh, of precipitation. So um, TMPA was the initial um, sort of uh, integrated. Uh, satellite and ground station data and now um, it's all transitioning into iMERGE and you can obtain those those data via um, Giovanni is a commonly used uh, web tool for obtaining those um, data products and that's all related to precipitation and the last one about nanoparticles if you're referring to plastic uh, in the in the sea, uh, we we'll have to look a little bit more into that. But uh, but uh, obviously, depending on the composition of the of the of the plastics, this would be the uh, how it reflects eventually back to the uh, to the sensor. Uh, but we'll we'll look at it a little bit into that and, and get back to you on, the, on that. So it looks like we're um, a little over time, actually, and the questions have slowed down. So um, maybe we'll end it for today. Um, and for all of you who didn't get your question answered or we said we would follow up with references and things like that, we'll be um, modifying the um, question and answer, answer document. And we'll be posting that online for you all to see um, at a later date, um, give it about a week or so, and we'll be doing that for each of the sessions. Um, mm -hmm. So you can come back and use that as a reference um, following this. Um, and I will go ahead and so you um, can contact myself or my colleague Juan um, for any further questions. So if we didn't get to your question today, um, and for any general RSET inquiries, you can email our program manager, Anna Prados. Her email is shown there. Um, and then again, we encourage you to take a look at a lot of the other RSET um, trainings that we have available, particularly those um, related to water, res water resources. And then um, we have listed all of the references here as well. Um, and you can follow up with that later on. But I just want to thank you all for, for being here with us today. And next week, we will uh, focus on the Riverscape Analysis Project, talk a little bit about landscape genetics and how to compare um, ground data with remotely sensed data for monitoring um, these types of habitats and fish species in particular. Um, so thank you all, and uh, we will see you again next week. Thank you, guys, and stay tuned for next week.